Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sea Road. How are you today? Good. Excellent. Glad that you are good. Even though it might rain, we're still going to be okay. It's not snowing yet, right? Come on. Wonderful that you are here, whether that means you are in person or online. We're in week three of this four-week series we've called Faith Foundations. We're taking a look at what does it mean to follow a blueprint for transformation. See, at Sea Road, we believe if we learn to love and live like Jesus, it's going to mean that we have to shift and change and move. And sometimes that change is going to be lovely, and sometimes that change is going to be a little bit more painstakingly slow. It's going to be a challenge, but as we become more and more like Jesus, the world around us changes. The people around us get inspired by the way we choose to live our lives, and it's a wonderful thing. But we've got to pay attention to our foundations of faith, how we are crafting, how we are living, how we are moving and being shaped by all things. In week one, we talked about telling and hearing, how we encounter the story of Jesus, how it transforms us if we allow it to, and it makes a difference in the way we choose to live. One of my favorite quotes, St. Francis of Assisi, always preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. That idea that we can live out the presence of Christ wherever we've been placed if we call ourselves a follower of God in some capacity. Then last week we talked about doing Doing. What does it mean to do Christianity? What does it mean to do our life in the framework of following Jesus? And we put out a challenge called the 224 Challenge. How do we set aside 10% of our day, two hours, 24 minutes, to do what is called kingdom doing? Not distracted doing, not neglectful doing, not even focused doing, self focused doing. How do we do kingdom doing? And I got to tell you, somebody asked me this past week, they're like, so, Pastor Jason, how are you doing in your kingdom doing? And I was like, oh, you're funny. Uh, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. But here's what I've noticed over this last week. I'm being more aware of when God is moving and working around me. I was meeting with a gentleman for coffee at Tim Hortons. And this random guy overheard our conversation and heard that I, sa I said I was born in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And he just kind of slid over into our conversation. And he said, hey. I was too. And for the next 20 minutes, my new friend Wayne told me his life story. It was incredible. Yeah, wonderful stuff. And I was like counting that time. I'm like, boom, kingdom doing, 24 minutes. <laughs> it's the whole idea and the premise. How do we participate in this gift of life that God has given us? And life, life is a gift. Even in the hard moments, even in the challenging spaces, Life is a gift. This week we're going to talk about being, okay? Being. And that phrase, being, it's a relational phrase. You and I are referred to as human beings, not human doings, which is really interesting. Because when you meet somebody new, all sorts of different stuff bubbles up in our conversations. Here's what I want you to do right now if you're here in this space. I want you to look for someone in this room that you haven't yet met or you don't know very well. Go ahead and give them the creepy stare, a little bit of a wave, yoo hoo okay? Now, if you're watching online and you're like, I'm watching by myself, imagine you're meeting someone for the first time. What are some of the questions that we would ask somebody that we're meeting for the first time? Go ahead, yell them out at me. What do you do? How many of you have used that in a conversation before? Oh, yeah. What else? Where do you live? Where are you from? What's your name? How many of you have forgotten to use that question in a conversation before? I have. I have sometimes. Okay, the insider secret here, okay? Some of you I've met before, and some of you I don't remember your name. So if I bring my wife along and I introduce my wife to you, that's my trick. I'm hoping that you're going to say your name, and I'm like, hey, this is my friend, Susan. Yeah. Okay, I can't believe I just divulged that secret. My goodness. In our North American construct and culture for relationship, most often you and I focus on our interaction based around our doing. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a plumber. I'm a teacher. I'm a, you know, a soffit and fascia dude. I'm a small business owner. I, I'm in the medical field. Whatever it is, we talk about our doing. 
My sister-in-law, Lisa, is an ASL interpreter, interpreter, American Sign Language. She works with the deaf culture and community. One of my favorite things about deaf culture is that when they meet somebody new or when they introduce you to somebody in their community, they talk about something pertaining to that individual's character. So they will say, hey, this is my joy-filled friend, Samara, or this is my funny individual, you know, Thomas, or whoever it might be, they'll introduce you based on a character quality of that individual in their culture. And sometimes they'll have a special sign to signify their importance or their connection to the deaf culture community. I think that's fascinating. Wouldn't that be interesting if that was our predominant way we lived life here in Canada? If we introduced ourselves based on our character or our being more than our doing? Our being represents something as human beings. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, God speaks within himself and he says, let us make man in our own image. And sometimes people get confused with that. They're like, is God confused about his gender? Does he know who he is? He's talking inclusive in communal language because the God that we know and we serve, the God of the Bible, is relationship. What that means is in, within himself, he's got this unique communal expression of what it looks like to be with one another. God reveals himself in the Bible as God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. But together they are one. And this is where some people get confused because they think that Christians serve more than one God. And at times they're right. At times they're right because you and I sometimes serve our money instead of Jesus. Or we serve our calendar instead of Jesus. Or we serve our self-interests instead of Jesus. We serve an idol. We don't serve the true, living, breathing God. But God in himself, the triune nature, the creator of the universe, he is perfect relationship within himself. And out of that perfect relationship, he decides to create you and me, human beings. And our relational bent, our relational connection is the very image, an imprint, an impression of who God is. It's called the Imago Dei, the image of God. I say all that to say, whether we need to be reminded or refreshed, human beings, we are relational in nature. For some of us, the hardest part of the last couple of years has been the absence of relationship. Now, for those of us who are introverts, when they said, we need you to stay at home and not to talk to anybody, we were like, yeah, woo, I don't have to say hello. And then month 8 or 9 or 10 or 12 or 14 or 16 goes by, and we're like, why are we crabby at the world? Why do we not like everything? Why are we yelling at the person that's walking by our house? 800 meters away. We are relational beings. In the absence of relationship, we crater and we decay. This is what we're going to dive into a little bit more as we understand the relational construct of who we are as, as human beings. We're going to look at one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 46. So you can start thumbing your way there if you've got your Bible in hand. If you don't have your Bible, please open the YouVersion Bible app on your mobile device. And you can go to the events section on the main screen, the live section, and then boom, you can join in with C-Road live and thumb your way through that. Before we get to the text, I want to outline for us four relational spaces that I believe each one of us orbits, whether we are aware of them or whether we are not. The first is what I'll call private space. Private space is usually when we are alone or isolated, our individual expression, but we are never really alone because God is always there present with us. And it's in that private space, there, there are some unique relational things that can take place in that environment. Outside of that private space, the next kind of layer is what I'll refer to as intimate space. It's where some people have access to you, but it's a, it's a smaller group of people. It might be like three, might be five, might be six. It's not very big. If you are married, it happens to also include your spouse. If it doesn't include your spouse, then you're doing something wrong. That intimate space, people who know you the best, accountability, all that stuff. The third space is a social space. 
This third relational space is a social space. It's a, it's a larger swell of people. Sometimes it could be like our extended family. It could include some friends at school. It, it could it include, it, excuse me, it could, it could include, <sighs> I was at a wedding last night. I got home late, okay? It could include some coworkers. That social space, it's usually around, you know, 12 to maybe 25. If you're a super extrovert, maybe you're like, I've got 40 friends. Do you really, though? Or you just got 40 people who know you? Then there's public space. Public space is like 40 plus, right? Public space. Here together, when we gather together on a Sunday in person, this kind of a public space expression. If we go to a, a sporting event or a concert or a play, that's usually a public space expression, and there's some relational dynamics and interactions that take place in those environments. Those are the four spaces I'm going to refer back to and talk through as we walk through Psalm 46. Psalm 46, I'm going to be reading the first and only 11 verses of the chapter, and then we're going to dive into it section by section and see what it speaks to you in terms of these relational spaces. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble, so we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come and see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He turns the shield. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. The Psalms are a really cool book in the Bible. They're like a collection of poetry written by various authors, some by a famous dude named David, some by others that we don't really know very well. And what I love about the Psalms is they're like these, these pictures of God at work or prayers spoken into being from individuals longing to see God work and move in various ways. And I believe this psalm, for me, highlights three different pictures that speak to these relational spaces that we're going to unpack with one another. Now, what's cool about these psalms is most often they were used in corporate worship just like this. They were spoken, they were sung. At times there was some creative artistic expression of living into what these would look like. And so we're going to play with that a little bit together as we dive into understanding what they speak to these relational spaces. I want to draw your attention once again to those first kind of three verses. If you've got your text open in front of you, what you're going to notice is that after these first three stands, three verses, there's a fun little word in italics on the bottom right-hand side that says interlude. That means break, dance break usually, but break. And so I want to walk you through this first picture. We're going to take a break. We're going to examine it, and then we're going to look at the next one. Verses 1 through 3 again, let me refresh this in our hearts and minds. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Lots happening in that word picture. The two words that I want us to kind of focus on is our and we. Those are inclusive terms, meaning a communal expression. 
When I read those first three verses, what I get in my mind's eye as I am trying to enter into what this could look like, add in my not only auditory learning but visual expression of what this could feel like, is a group of people, a small cluster, standing firm against the chaos. Have any of you, have any of you um, lived through an earth, earthquake, like an earthquake happened right where you were? Okay, a handful of you. So you understand that, like, it is completely out of your control. I've only ever been in an area that experienced one earthquake, and believe it or not, it was Red Deer, Alberta. And you're like, Red Deer gets earthquakes? We were dead asleep. And about 1.30 in the morning, all of a sudden, something shook our bed and woke us up. Usually it's a kid. And we're like, yeah, it's definitely one of the children. And so it was a small little tremor. It was nothing big, like stuff didn't fall off the walls or anything like that, but it shook. Thought nothing of it, went, huh, no kids bugging me? I'm going to roll over. Boom, back to bed. Woke up the next morning to discover it was actually an earthquake in Red Deer. Now, if you know where Red Deer is, it's in the middle of nowhere, not by an ocean, not by a tectonic plate. It should not experience earthquakes, and yet, uh, periodically, the space gets earthquakes. Really weird, really interesting. Not like San Francisco. San Francisco is like the earthquake capital of North America. Like, if you are living in San Francisco, you should be expecting to live through earthquakes. I've said this before, but I always find it fascinating, so please humor me as I share this once again. The core of San Francisco, their downtown, the foundation of their biggest buildings are built on wheels. Why? Because they get earthquakes. And when the earth quakes, things shake. And so their thought process was, what if the building just moved with the ebbs and flows with the earthquake? And then when it was ebbing and flowing, maybe the glass would crack, but maybe the building itself wouldn't fall because its foundation is built on something that will help it last. See, when we talk about this intimate space, the people that have the closest access to our lives, I think about these three verses. A cluster of people standing firm against the earthquakes, willing to negotiate the challenging, turbulent times of the day. We need people in our lives challenging the way we think. It is not appropriate for us to walk around with prejudices or racist thoughts, ageist thoughts, sexist thoughts in our hearts and our minds and live from that space. And the only way we get challenged is when we allow people to have access to who we are. And for some of us, we're like, yeah, yeah, I got, I got close friends, whatever. You can't gender this and say women have close friends and men don't because the truth is some of us don't have friends. No fault of our own necessarily, but some of us don't have friends. We haven't allowed people access to who we are for various reasons. Maybe we're living in a place that we just don't like. And we're like, I'd rather not be here, so instead of Digging into creating community right where I am, I'm just going to pretend. I'm going to pretend I'm going to coast through and pray that Jesus would let me move to some other place. Maybe some of you have thought of that about our church. You're like, well, I've tried all of them, and this one's the, the one that I hate the least. Right? Right? That intimate space, whether we like it or not, we're created for relationship in that core. And in the absence of that, you and I can go squirrely. We can, we can believe lies. We can easily be moved away from the foundation that is firmed because nobody is there standing with us. And so we get swept up in whatever turbulence happens in that day. Let us draw our attention back to these three verses, right? When, when the author is writing this, this picture, it's amazing. It's amazing. It says that God's are, are our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble, so we will not fear when the earthquakes come. 
we've got a group of people that are journeying and walking with us, we don't need to be afraid of what is happening around us or sometimes even in us. A life change of some kind. Heaven forbid this happens. You go to work today and they say, we have reassigned your job to somebody else who is younger, smarter, faster, quicker than you, and also cheaper. So farewell, early retirement. Right? Lisa Laflamme style. Now we can get bitter, we can get frustrated, we can get angry, we can get, dare I say it, vindictive. We can evoke our keyboard warrior status and start chirping away and gather people up onto our side and this, that, and the other. But what if we had a cluster of people that we could lean on? That could help us see that in that moment, as chaotic as it could be, maybe there's some hope mixed in with the chaos. We don't get that if we don't have people who have access to our lives. We had the awesome privilege through this last year of celebrating in various degrees with a a cluster of people in our church that got engaged and then married. It was awesome. We had a string of them. Like I mentioned, I was at one last night. I'm going to be at one two weeks from now. I got plans for next year as well. It's amazing. People getting married. When I sit with these couples and we talk about pre-marriage coaching, one of the things I tell them is that friction is not a bad thing. Friction is not a bad thing. It's how you use friction. See, sometimes when we have a, a differing idea than somebody in our close group of people, a friend that we hold dear. Maybe it's a political ideology that is different than our own or political conviction that has emerged in some way or shifted or changed and we don't see eye to eye. Sometimes we think that's a bad thing. Like we need to now move away from that relationship because they don't agree with us fully. But what if it's actually a good thing? What if their different perspective, their different thought, their different even slightly variation in value is helpful to us in some way? What if it rounds out our thinking? What if it helps us to see something that is not naturally seen by who we are? Jesus had friends just like this. Yeah, Jesus had friends. Their names are James and John and Peter. Peter was an interesting fellow. James and John were brothers. They were known as the Sons of Thunder. You don't get that moniker by being easy to work with and by having all the nicest, politest language all the time, in my opinion. These three had a closer pool of access to who Jesus was. They had experiences with Jesus different than the rest of his 12 disciples, different than the crowds, different than his other social circles. They had access to him. They saw him in different moments and times. They they experienced things. Each one of us needs that. In fact, if we aren't engaged in that relationship, expression that looks like that, that, in that intimate space, we are suffering in our lives and we don't even know it. We're decaying because that's part of who we are. Jesus himself had it. Jesus himself created it. Therefore, if we want to be like Jesus, we should do the very same thing. That's going to take time and effort and all those things, but we have to be pursuing that. Let's continue because there's more with Psalm 46 says about relational stuff, and I think it gets even more fascinating. The next picture that comes up from this text is verses 4 through 7, and then there's an interlude or a dance break. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. Their nations, the nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. crumble. God's voice and thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. The words that I want to pull from this text that kind of speak to our next layers of social space, I'm going to to kind of talk about our social space and our public space in the same tandem because I think these verses speak to what elements of community are present in those environments. The word city, 
When you think of the word city, what comes to your mind? Go ahead, yell it out at me. Toronto, okay. Classic Ontarian. City, Toronto, love it. What else? Skyscrapers. Skyscrapers. What else? Smog? Traffic. People. People. Okay, Brockville is a city. Last time I checked, we don't have any skyscrapers. Smog. We got people, though. Did you know that in order to become a city in Canada, you have to reach a certain threshold in terms of population? Does anybody happen to know what that threshold is? 20,000? Unless you live out west and it's like 4,000. And we're like, yay, city! (laughs) Right? There's a threshold. There's an expectancy in order for it to become a city, it, it is this large. Social space, public space functions in the same way. It reaches a threshold, a number. This is why people can get fascinated with numbers, and it can be positive, it can be negative. But social interactions happen in that space. Think of it like this. In a social space or in a public space, you can be known for who you are, or you can be known anonymously. You can walk into a social space, people know your name, they know your story, and and they can connect with you. Or you can walk into a public space, and they don't have a clue who you are. One of my favorite things of growing up out west, whenever I put on my Leafs jersey and walk downtown Calgary, I discovered who my friends were. (laughs) It was amazing how many people would honk at me and yell polite things, not just impolite things. You would go to a a Calgary Flames home game and 50% or more of the fans in the stands wore the blue and white. Come on. Go Leafs, go. It was incredible. You were in Alberta. Home of the Flames. And yet the blue and white would reign supreme. Even though when we lost the game, it was like, whatever. I had all my people to share in the misery. Sometimes we confuse the purpose of a public space. And we think a public space should function like an intimate space. Now here's what I want us to understand. God is still present there, right? A river brings joy to the city of God. Joy can be found in a social space, a public space. God dwells in that city. God can be discovered in that space. The nations are in chaos. See, that's what happens when lots of us get together and we don't dig into what real relationship looks like. The nations can be in chaos. The individuals can be in chaos. Sometimes we confuse, as I said, public space for intimate space. We walk into an environment and we think to ourselves, why don't they care about everything that I'm going through in the moment? We do, but we don't have access to everything. Nor do we need it. In your intimate space, there's a cluster of people that God has created to walk with you. More deeply than I can as your pastor or any of our pastoral staff or any of our key volunteers or any of our board members. There's a next layer of community that exists for you. You just got to find it and create it. The cool thing is sometimes we can go into a public space and environment and be seen and be recognized. But if we're honest, sometimes we want to go into a public space and not be seen. I love walking downtown Ottawa. Nobody knows who I am. It is brilliant. And yeah, people do yell things. Most of them are awesome. Like, hey, who's that hot guy? And I'm like, I don't know. It's got to be me. (laughs) And then they see like they're doing like a male model photo shoot behind me. I'm like, oh, okay. My bad. My bad. But I have one person who thinks I'm hot and that's all I need. It's my wife. Sometimes we confuse what a social space and a public space is meant for. Yeah, we need to enjoy being together in some sort of crowd, in some sort of space. But sometimes what we're looking for 
happens at a deeper level. And I think here in North America in particular, it's, it's the thing that we've been most poor at when it comes to relationship. We can know a lot of people, know things about a lot of people, but do we really know somebody? And do they really know us? What makes us tick? How we think? What our struggles are? What our frustrations are? You might have a great relationship with a coworker or your supervisor, and you could be like, oh, hey, they know when I have a problem because I let them know. It's more than that. It's a group of people that are willing to pray with you along the way, walk with you into the hard times, celebrate with you in the good times, and be present in every space and every element in between. Those kinds of people... Those kinds of people are found with two kind of streams. I'll I'll talk about these two words and then we'll move on. Proximity and affinity. Proximity means is who's right around us. Who's right around us? Who's in our relational orbit and sphere? And affinity, what we have in common. Most of us, when we gather together in a public space, we have an affinity, a connection. We are here together, whether we are aware of it or not, to worship who Jesus is or to discover a little bit more about who this Jesus is or Christianity or church. We have something in common. We have a level of affinity that connects us all. But if we want to go deeper, if we want to have true relationship, we not only need to have affinity, we need to have people that are right there with us. It's really hard to have a really close, challenging infusing, invigorating, encouraging relationship where, where distance is always involved. Talk to any young adult couple right now that is working through trying to date when there's a, a tremendous amount of distance involved in that relationship. It is hard. Some of you don't know this about Bonnie and I, but uh, we dated twice before I convinced her I was the one. We were separated by only three hours, but it might as well have been 30,000 kilometers. It was hard to navigate that distance and that relationship, and one of us was really poor at it. I won't name any names, but it might rhyme with hasten. See, sometimes... We, we convince ourselves that we've got this layer of connection because I got this friend from where I grew up that I haven't seen or hasn't been involved in my life for the last 14 years, and, and there's somebody that I can reach out to. Man, you could, you, could, you could fake it till you make it in that one. You could project all sorts of whatever you want to in those spaces. In a public space, you can walk in and be like, hey, everything's great, it's awesome, it's amazing. And then 10 days later, we find out that you've left your family because Because you weren't happy or because you were struggling with some mental health or there's some financial challenges and nobody knew. You can do all sorts of expressions of what community looks like in a social and a public space. And while those things are healthy and they're and they're, and they're good to have and to nurture and to prioritize, they cannot be our only relational connection with one another or with God. Let's look at the last little picture here, verses 8 through 11. Let me remind you of these things. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the word world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. May it be so, Lord. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. These three verses, I think, are a great visual expression of what that private space looks like. A private relational space is where you are connecting with your creator. Some people call that devotion. Some people call that hiking. Some people call that worshiping in the car while I'm on my commute. Some people call that prayer. All of those things. It's whatever environment you create so that you can interact with relationally the God who created you. That's what private space looks like. 
If we aren't nurturing that private space connection, then guess what happens? There's decay that erodes in all of the other spaces that we occupy. Listen, I know it. I've lived it. I breathe it. There are times where I multiply the absence of things that I want in my family. Maybe I was cranky that day. Maybe I was frustrated. Maybe I was a little bit bitter. Maybe I was angry that somebody had the audacity to send me that kind of a letter. Maybe I was frustrated at a, at a, at a wound that I thought that was healed that got picked at and poked at. And instead of love and grace and mercy that I was investing in other people, it became gossip and bitterness and slander. And everything outside of who God is. See, that's why the private space is so important. We need to spend time with Jesus so that we can, we can become more like Jesus. And if the only time we connect with Jesus is in a public space, we only get to know this much, a microscopic amount on who Jesus is. It's like friendship with somebody only in a social setting where other 150 or 200 or 10,000 people are present. It's surface level relationship. You've got to go deeper. I've got to go deeper. By inviting Jesus into my everyday, my routine even, looking for where he's active, looking for how he might speak. See, in the private space, when we are present with our creator, that, that's our truest self. It's our truest self. When we are most authentically us. Because there doesn't need to have any sort of expectations or any sort of depictions of what we think we should be. We could just be us. I've said this before. Some of my favorite times with Jesus are called scream wars. Where I've been frustrated and I did not know what's happening. And so I yelled in my car. And I'm sure my neighbors thought, this guy is either screamo dude or something is psychologically wrong with him. And maybe there was in the moment. We're coming up on the uh, one year anniversary of my brother-in-law's death. And if you know the story, he was tragically lost his life in a workplace accident. <clears throat> on that day, I had one of the most difficult conversations that I've ever had in my life, and I hope I never have to have it again. <clears throat> Telling my kids that their uncle that they desperately loved was no longer here. They were at youth that night, our two oldest. That ride from my house to the church was the longest ride of my life. It was the loudest lo ride of my life as well. As I screamed and I yelled and I didn't understand. But I needed to have that private time with Jesus. Because my kids, my kids were going to experience something devastating in just a few moments. And I needed to make sure that I was going to be okay and stable so I could be there and present with them. See, the truth is, the people in our lives are going through chaos and challenges and frustrating pieces. And so we, we have an opportunity to love and live like Jesus in that space. But we have nothing to offer in those relation, relational environments unless we are renewed, restored, and refreshed by the presence of Jesus first. That private space. That be still space. If you're struggling as a parent right now and you don't understand teenagers... Spend time in your private space. If you're struggling as a single individual right now, you're frustrated with your life trajectory, you're frustrated that nobody is, is pursuing you romantically, or you're frustrated that everybody thinks that you need to pursue somebody romantically, wherever you might be in that spectrum, if you spend time with Jesus in that private space, it will help you inform and shape and renew all those other social spaces. If you're disconnected in your marriage right now, spend time with Jesus in that private space. Let him refresh, renew, restore you. Then take that into your intimate space. See, it's like a filter, a cascade. I love waterfalls. I think it's hilarious that Brockville boasts that we have a waterfall. Any, anybody seen it? It's like a trickle, okay? 
If you go just uh, by Brock West Church, part of the Brock Trail, there's part of the, what is it, Buell's Creek that sort of flows ever so slightly down about 18 inches <laughs> on a rocks. But you can hear it, and it sounds like a waterfall. And if you go on Brockville Tourism, it's Brockville's Waterfall. It's wonderful. That's what happens in our relationship. We spend time in our relational spheres, our relational spaces. We spend time with God. That cascades out of our life. It overflows out of our life and it trickles down into our intimate space, into our social space, into our public space. It impacts it all. But when the water stops flowing, there's nothing left to flow into the other spaces. This is why community is so important here at Sea Road. This is why we push it. This is why we talk about it. This is why in just a few moments, I am going to encourage you with as much vigor and enthusiasm as I can to create this kind of layers of community in your own life. Because without it, we have nothing to offer the world around us. But when we spend time with Jesus, we have everything to offer in that space. I'm going to be inviting my friend Noel up here. And what she's going to do is she's going to speak a spoken word over us. It's lyrics from another song. A gentleman by the name of Isaac Slide. He was part of a band called The Fray. And he writes this song based on Psalm 46. And in particular... That one verse, verse 10. I'm going to say this right now as Noel comes and joins us on stage. Verse 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. As Noel makes her way up here, And she takes a moment to speak these words of hope and life and, yes, even desperation in in us, into us, and over us. I want to invite you to take a posture of receptivity. Now, sometimes for that, it means we need to, like, open up our hands because we're receiving something, like we're catching something that somebody's throwing to us. For some of us, it might be more of a posture of surrender where it's like this. For others of us, we're like, I ain't doing nothing because people are looking at me. This ain't about people looking at you. This is about hearing from Jesus what he wants to say to us about being still and being known and being seen by him. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know I am. When darkness comes upon you and colors you with fear and shame, Be still and know that I am with you, and I will say your name. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know I am. If terror falls upon your bed and sleep no longer comes, remember all the words I said, be still, be still and know. And when you go through the valley and the shadow comes down from the hill, if morning never comes to be, Be still, be still, be still. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know I am. If you forget the way to go and lose where you came from, if no one is standing beside you, be still and know I am. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know I'm here. Be still and know that I'm with you. Be still, be still and know. Be still and know that I am with you. Be still and know I am. Be still and know that I am with you. That is a relational phrase from a relational God spoken to relational beings like you and me. Be still and know. I am. I mentioned about a month ago, if you were here, that I was going to be on this stage begging, pleading, imploring you to make relational community 
a priority in your life. Well, today's that day. Right in the lobby area after this service, we've got a group of tables set up, and it's all about the various groups that are right now open to new people joining to create these layers of connection and community. Not all of our groups are representative there. Many of you are like, hey, I'm good. I'm already in a group. I've got my intimate space, all that stuff. Not everybody has the luxury that you do if you found connection in all those spaces. My challenge to you, if you happen to be one of those individuals, is what might it look like to open that space or multiply that space so others could get connected? If you are a sea rotor, if that's going to be who you are moving forward, a sea rotor is somebody who prioritizes community. And that community just isn't found, it's created. It takes a little step of courage. So look at that person that you were like, I don't know them at the beginning of the, this sermon. Look at them again and be like, yoo-hoo, hey, maybe that's the person I don't know. Maybe it's not. But all of us need relationships. We can try to avoid it. We can try and deny it. But the truth is, we all need to be still and know that God is. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to dismiss us and launch us into restoration and recovery and renewal when it comes to our relationships. Would you pray, pray with me? And if you're able, stand together as we pray. Father, I am so grateful that you are a relational, loving, passionate God who relentlessly pursues us despite all of our idiosyncrasies, our uniquenesses, our frustrations, and dare I even say it, bad habits. I thank you that because of your relational vitality, we can never outrun you. We can never outthink you. We can never outlast you. We can always find hope and renewal and restoration in you. I've got a dream, Lord, and my dream is that it would be a crazy group of people in eastern Ontario who would be so captivated by you in a relational capacity that the closest friendships in their lives would radiate your presence. And from those intimate moments of connection, it would spill over into our social and public circles that people would, would know that there's got to be more to life than what they're living right now because of what they see in us in terms of joy, in terms of hope in the midst of hardship, in terms of, of passion in a listless society or whatever it might be. Jesus, I think that's what you're inviting us into. And so I pray that you would give us that little microscopic element of courage that we all need to make a shift and make a change. Lord, I pray that the excuses would be silenced. I'm too old. I'm not mobile enough. I don't like anything in person. I'm scared of this. Blah, 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 blah. All of that stuff would just be silenced. And instead... Your voice that says, be still and know that I am God, would lead us forward. I get this picture of a mother quieting a child who seems inconsolable. But as she starts to hum, that little one settles in and snuggles and finds hope and rest. For those of us who can identify with that, in this moment, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help them discover that it's not our job, it is their opportunity to find and create community wherever they've been placed. Father, would you bless and protect us? Would you make your face shine upon us, be gracious to us? Would you turn your face towards us and grant us your peace as we do the challenging and sometimes unthinkable thing of trying to be the relational beings that you've created us to be. Peace over households, peace over marriages, peace over its strained relationships. 
God, you are the God of glory. You are the God of hope. You are the God of peace. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.